panel here discussion on the Volcker Rule. I'm Michael McKenzie with the Financial Times, and I'm very happy to be here and to be joined by a very good uh, panel. Um, to my left here is Charles Calamaris, who is the Henry Kaufman Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia. Sitting next to Charles is Ma Matthew Richardson, who is the Director of the Salomon Center at New York University. And at the end here is uh, Jennifer Marietta Westberg, who's the De Deputy Director and Deputy Chief Economist in the Division of Risk Strategy and Financial Innovation at the SEC. Um, we're here to talk about the Volcker Rule, which um, is long been mooted, um, yet to be implemented. No one really seems to have a firm idea when we'll actually see the Volcker Rule being implemented. And in some ways, it's rather apt that this is named after a former Federal Reserve Chairman given that the art of central banking is to actually persuade people to do something before a central bank actually does move to an action. Um, we've certainly seen banks on Wall Street fully implement what they think is the Volcker Rule in terms of withdrawing from the markets, withdrawing from their market making activities. We've seen a massive flight of proprietary traders leaving Wall Street banks and moving into the buy side, such as hedge funds and uh, institutional investment shops. And it does matter. The Volcker Rule is very important, and we're seeing how it's playing out right now, given the sharp rise in interest rates in the last six weeks. We've seen an elevation in volatility and a lack of liquidity, particularly in areas of the market, such as junk bonds, mortgages, and corporate debt, mainly because banks are no longer here to support these markets as market makers. So to get the discussion rolling here with the panel, I'd like to first start with uh, Jennifer, who's going to sort of give us an overview of the sort of pros and cons, broadly speaking, of the Volcker Rule based on the comment letters that regulators have received since this was first um, proposed. So, turn to you. Thank you. So let me give the standard dis disclaimer that the views I express today are my own and not necessarily those of the Commission or my colleagues at the Commission. As mentioned by Michael, uh, on this particular rule, we have had more than 16,000 comment letters come in since the rule was jointly proposed. I'm going to highlight what I think are the economic questions and um, sort of broadly where the comments have come in on both sides of those economic questions. So just a brief introduction and summary of the rule, the Volcker rules, the provision of Dodd-Frank that prohibits entities that either receive deposit insurance from the FDIC or that have access to the Federal Reserve borrowing facilities from engaging in proprietary trading. Now, in a too big to fail world, risk shifting incentives are such that you need, potentially, some sort of mechanism to cap the size of the contingent liability facing taxpayers. I think this is part of the motivation behind the rule. The Volcker Rule is one such mechanism to do that. And by placing limits on the assets banks can hold and prohibiting an activity that is deemed non-core to the banking sector. This opens up a lot of questions. As I said, I'm going to focus, I think, sort of broadly where the economic questions lie. For example, is it the non-core activities, such as prop trading, or, in addition, possibly the core activities, such as lending and underwriting, that are systemically risky? Also, in terms of the bigger picture, what is the most efficient way to regulate and manage systemic risk? Is it capital requirements? Is it limits on risk take or limits on asset holdings? Is it some combination? So as an economist um, in our division, we often turn to the academic literature as our first starting place um, for an examining an issue. And this is an area where we have a bit um, of literature that's relevant, but we don't have a lot. So there has been, in the past few years, um, much literature developing in terms of the measurement of systemic risk within the financial sector. So since you read through the statute and you read through congressional discussion of the purpose of the Volcker Rule, uh, that purpose in part is at least to reduce systemic risk. So one way to approach this as an economist is to think about how you might measure systemic risk. There has been some work there. Um, I'll just briefly talk about a couple of methods. So there was a paper, paper developed looking at systemic expected shortfall developed by Acharya, Peterson, Philippon, and Richardson. Measures an individual firm's propensity to be undercapitalized when the financial system as a whole is undercapitalized. There's also COVAR, developed by Adrian and Brunemeyer. Measures the VAR of the financial system, conditional on institutions being under distress. So that's one way we can at least try to figure out 
what changes we make in the financial sector, what will be their actual effect on either contributing to or reducing systemic risk. Now, to what extent does prop trading contribute to systemic risk? So this is obviously at the crux of what the Volcker Rule is trying to do. It's much harder to answer because it's difficult to measure prop trading. It's not something that we have a lot of publicly available data on. There was a GAO study that looked at standalone prop trading desks at the six largest bank holding companies. So again, they were only able to look at the six largest. While they might have gotten a lot of the activity, they obviously weren't able to get all of the activity since they looked at just standalone desks as well. We have had information coming in um, from places like the GF GAO, from academic literature. There's also policy papers, one submitted by Senators Merkley and Levin, looking at trading account assets. Now, there are ways uh, that to prop trade outside of a standalone prop desk, and this has been uh, one of the crucial issues of this particular rule. Many, many activities besides prop trading, such as market making, dealing, or hedging, can go into the trading account as well. One other uh, relevant paper that we came across by Brunemeyer, Dong, and Paulia found that banks with higher non-interest income have a higher contribution to systemic risk. Now, the problem with that particular paper in terms of applying to this rule is that there are other elements contributing to non-interest income, such as, say, VC activities. It's not just prop trading that's being measured. So open questions that the literature doesn't necessarily speak to at this point. How does prop trading within the bank add value to the financial system and more broadly benefit the economy? It's something that's, I think, particularly crucial to study. Core banking activities such as lending and underwriting are systemically risky, but are not easily replicated outside the banking sector. Prop trading is not a core activity, and it can be replicated outside the banking sector. Most obvious example is a hedge fund. So one argument um, is that prop trading may be the most economical way to exploit risk-shifting incentives, in that it may be become easier to be too big to fail. This is certainly a line of thinking that we have seen in our comment letters. On the other side, we have seen arguments that by being active in asset markets, Financial intermediaries can learn more about market conditions, which enables them to provide more valuable financial services that are core to the banking sector, basically an information effect. So a question related to that line of thinking is can they also learn these valuable piece of, pieces of information through other activities like market making? Does it have to be prop trading? So this gets us into the next question, is uh, by far the question that we've received the most comment on, how can regulators distinguish between permitted market making and prohibited proprietary trading? We have a lot of comment on this. So uh, another way to think about this is how you implement the rule in a way that does not harm market making and liquidity. So some important issues there, they obviously can look very much alike, particularly in some illiquid asset classes like over the uh, counter markets where inventory imbalances may be the norm. So a general assumption has been that the Volcker Rule, uh, I'm in one line of thinking anyway in the comments, one uh, general assumption has been that the Volcker Rule will harm liquidity, say in the corporate bond market particularly. We, we received a large study um, speaking to that effect. Now part of the rule that was proposed, uh, regulators will use metrics to distinguish between prop trading and market making and there were several metrics that were proposed as possibilities. One line of comment that we have seen is that market tr making desks will be hesitant to do a trade with a customer if it makes their metrics look, let's say, bad. And that this line of comment has argued that this will then have a chilling effect um, on certain markets. So banks may retreat from providing liquidity precisely in those markets where it's most valuable. And these commenters further go on to argue um, and favor a capital requirement approach to regulating systemic risk. Another line of comment that we've seen that I think is important economically is if market making desks are also prop trading, are they supplying or demanding liquidity? So typically in economics when we model market making, we model them as uninformed agents who set prices by observing order flow. And if we're looking at an over-the-counter illiquid market, is that the right model? Or do we need to think about altering that model? 
So one line of argument has been that the Volcker rule will actually support liquid markets because it will get incentives um, to trade, the incentives to trade on information or front-run clients can actually drain liquidity from the market. So there's been an argument that under Volcker, the market-making desks will focus on providing liquidity. Another point has been that liquidity obviously is most valuable in times of crisis. And so in systemically important institutions, problems can actually bleed into all business lines. That leads to an aggregate capital shortfall that could actually prevent the institution from providing financial intermediation services. So if removing prop trading from the banking sector reduces the likelihood of an aggregate capital shortfall, uh, one line of comment has argued that liquidity would actually be preserved. So, you know, just in closing, again, to think about what is the optimal policy response to systemic risk, how do you counter these risk-shifting incentives? There basically have been two lines of thought. Capital re requirements really focus on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. That's not the approach of the Volcker rule. Capital requirements, it's argued, would ensure banking entities have enough capital so that equity holders absorb losses during systemic events rather than taxpayers. Lots of prop trading, though, can have payoffs that look similar to writing out of the money put options, so small gains most of the time, but big losses some of the time. So the amount of capital required to cover big losses, it's been argued by some, could be inefficient most of the time. The approach of the Volcker rule has been to focus on the left-hand side of the balance sheet by limiting assets and putting restrictions on prop trading, again, arguing that capital regulation is inefficient for the reasons that I just mentioned. But the difficulty of distinguishing between prop trading and market making obviously makes this particular approach um, difficult in some ways to implement. So I'll set that up as the sort of both sides of the rule. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, let's turn now to Matt. And Matt, you've sort of got some interesting thoughts here, particularly looking at you know, what an optimal systemic risk regulation might look like. And why capital regulation is not sufficient by itself, but that some structural reform like Volcker perhaps is needed, and whether or not does it make sense to have Volcker in this context, and then looking at the implement implementation issues with the Volcker rule. If I can figure out how to use the uh, laptop. I will say I wasn't going to have slides when Charlie uh, put some slides over this week. I decided to do so. Lenovo is obviously different than Um, so before I uh, um, get into the Volcker rule, I do want to say that some of the um, uh, comments I'm going to make here are included in our book uh, that we wrote about the kind of the economics of the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, yesterday, there was a lot of criticism of Dodd-Frank, um, and one of the speakers called it uh, Franken-Dodd, um, <laughs> partly for its uh, size. So the claim to fame of our book is we're actually longer than the Dodd-Frank Act itself. So when you write a book, you ask for people to endorse the book because that helps sell copies. So we, we actually got Volcker to be one of the endorsers. And 
What do I do to click? Okay. And um, I'll put what he, this, I just, uh, just highlighted three, four words that he wrote in his endorsement, which was not a quick read. Um, when your endorser uh, actually uh, criticizes the book, um, it's, uh, there's no wonder we didn't, uh, copies didn't fly off the, um, off the top. I will say that the book itself is actually, although it tries to be balanced, uh, it's written with about 15 to 20 uh, professors at, at NYU. Um, it actually ends up being fairly critical, a bit of an indictment of Dodd-Frank. Um, so the, what I'm going to talk about today is the Volcker Rule. So I'm really not kind of going to re-legislate Dodd-Frank. I'm going to talk about the Volcker Rule, given that we have Dodd-Frank. So given we have Dodd-Frank, are we better off with the Volcker Rule or without a Volcker Rule? So that's the perspective that um, I'm, uh, I'm taking, taking here. And I should point out that I kind of... I protected myself with my NYU colleagues um, here, but of all the chapters in the book and everything, I would say that probably there's, you know, there's much less unanimity about Volcker than there is um, about a lot of the other stuff uh, in, in the book. As it was, you'll see when Charlie, um, who's at Columbia, so it's NYU Columbia, pro-Volcker, anti-Volcker, really, ex really exciting stuff. Um, Okay, so let me quickly just describe what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a step back and just give very quickly what we think sort of maybe the right approach to regulation and why Dodd-Frank doesn't uh, do it, but in the sense of which you could argue Dodd-Frank may be second best there. I'm going to give the logic of the Volcker Rule, which is very close to what Jennifer outlined. I'm just going to make a very quick statement that uh, principal trading was a big factor during the crisis. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. People can talk about many different things, uh, whether it's um, the quality of loans, shadow, bank, um, shadow banking, but at the end of the day, it all ended up being um, uh, channeled through, through this, uh, this trading on the, on the front of banks. I'm going to then talk about why capital regulation isn't sufficient on its own within Dodd-Frank. And, and so why you might need a structural form, Volcker being one example. Then I'll give some criticisms of the Volcker, two in, in particular, that get the most play. And then I want to talk a little bit about implementation, and maybe there's maybe a way to perhaps get around some of the issues that Jennifer mentioned that I think are, are valid. Um, so, so, you know, it's well known in economics that, you know, if you're going to uh, impose kind of regulation. You should do it where there's market failure. Um, so regulation is needed when markets can't solve the problems on their own. Uh, there are a number of examples from the financial crisis. Uh, mispriced, unpriced government guarantees is one. And systemic risk is another. The idea that a firm takes certain amounts of risk, those risks impose costs on other firms in the financial system and more broadly on the overall economy. They don't internalize those risks, so therefore you get too much systemic risk being produced. So we've done some work, I think uh, Jennifer mentioned the paper with Viral, Lassie and Tomar about sort of measuring systemic risk and um, working through that. So one of this kind of solutions, it's, it's not a very deep one, but is that one way to, to get to solve a problem of systemic risk is to get firms to internalize those risks. And you can do kind of a surcharge on financial institutions. We kind of have a little model that shows it can be proportional to the level of systemic risk. So what do I point that out? So that's really, you know, we would much prefer a, a regulatory system that really focused on the problems, which, were, which is the risk that's being produced at these uh, firms. One of the outcomes of this model when you impose systemic risk as you do, you impose these surcharges, you do change behavior. And what these firms do is they still produce some systemic risk, they pay for it, but they also choose to be less levered and they choose a different asset, a risky asset profile, less systemically risky assets. So you could, that's not the way Dodd-Frank went at all, but you can look at Dodd-Frank and say to yourself, what does it do? Well, it puts kind of hard constraints on financial institutions leverage and it puts some kind of restrictions, some structural form, and in this case, some restrictions on, on the type of assets uh, you can hold or, or trade. And so you can think about, you know, if this is the outcome that you get from a first best system, you know, Dodd-Frank is trying to sort of capture these two things 
by dictating what those leverage levels and asset holdings might be. So that's a sense in which I think you know, Dodd-Frank does fit into the overall regulatory framework in a, in a big picture sense, albeit not uh, first best. So what's the logic to the uh, Volcker rule? So Jennifer's already mentioned this, but there are many activities that are systemically risky. Lending to corporations, lending to households is risky. Washington Mutual lent to households and went under and was a big institution and probably created systemic risk on the system. Fee-related businesses doing M&A advisory work is systemically risky. The, work dis the business disappears uh, in a crisis and you no longer get those fees if you borrowed against the market value of those businesses, um, it, it hurts you. And principal trading is systemically risky. So many things are systemically uh, risky. It's not just um, trading on your own account. I think one of the differences, if you'd like to, there's a big literature about why are banks banks. Uh, Charlie's been involved in that as well. And so one of the things about, um, and I'll just point out three papers there, Pharma, Diamond, and Peterson, and Rajan, uh, is that certain things are really core to banks and aren't duplicable outside the banking sector. So kind of lending to corporations and households is one of those things that comes up. There are certain comparative advantages that banks have, the way they fund themselves and the way they um, monitor that you really can't do outside. So you can't really uh, touch that. Um, but principal trading, it's not clear that is so core and can't be done uh, elsewhere. There are mutual funds, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, etc., that buy and sell the uh, same types of securities. Of course, those institutions are much less levered um, and don't have access to the uh, government uh, safety net. So why do we care? So I think the, there's two reasons. One is that when you have these activities within the banking sector, um, you're adding risk to the banking sector. And if you think the banking sector is more systemically risky, that's a question, but you think it's more systemically risky than other parts, than the mutual fund or asset management area, um, then that's a reason to, to look more closely at um, these holdings. And there's also the, the point that Volcker makes a lot, which um, I think is uh, reasonable as well. If there is part of the financial system that has access to the safety net, whether it's deposit insurance, or whether it's too big to fail or some other um, a potential uh, measure, giving uh, that safety net and then allowing them to transact in uh, a non-core part of the market, you know, is not sort of what you want to be doing because that's going to push up um, increased leverage in the system and that's going to increase systemic uh, risk um, as well. Um, so principal trading and systemic risk. So was it, why, you know, why, why even think about this in terms of, independent of sort of the economics of it, was it relevant for this crisis? I'd argue it was, like, it was highly relevant. If you looked at the uh, failure of the financial system in the US and abroad during the initial crisis in 2008, and then the European crisis that emerged uh, again a couple of years later, you know, in the US and abroad, there were, uh, investments in asset-backed securities, they were done in a way to avoid capital requirements. Rather than hold the loans with certain capital, you could securitize them, sell them off, and bring them back on your balance sheet. And they did that in a variety of ways. We talked about yesterday, you heard uh, Anil talk about shadow banking. The entire shadow banking system, other than money market funds, prime brokerage, derivatives, uh, repo, um, all of these activities were really just concentrated at the large institutions that engaged in these activities. It was, these institutions were basically using, creating or using the um, shadow banking system to make these kind of bets. Why make them? You don't have to hold capital and they offer a spread. Um, there you go. It, uh, I think um, going into uh, 2007, uh, UBS had 50 billion of this stuff on their books. Citigroup, 70, 55 billion. Merrill Lynch, 70 billion. You can just go down the line and see uh, the amount of asset-backed securities that were being held um, in inventory, and most of it uh, financed overnight through repo and and other um, other areas. Um, European banks, you know, look at the French banking system and what and the trouble the French banking system was running into a year, year and a half ago, 
we know, it was basically they were holding a large amount of uh, peripheral debt in the Euro system, Portugal, Greece, well, Portugal and Spain especially. And if you look, why are they holding it? It's a spread, no capital uh, attached to it. So I think that, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, these institutions when it, with certain advantages um, are going to take actions that other institutions can't, uh, can't adjust to. I mean, an example I would give is, was the French banking system holding that much peripheral sovereign debt so they could make a market um, in sovereign debt for its clients, or were they taking a big whopping bet, um, a, a, a carry trade spread bet? So I think principal trading um, has been the source of, of a lot of the problems we've seen over the last five, six uh, years. Now, of course, we have capital regulation which, uh, in theory, can come in and maybe solve this problem. I talked about uh, the model earlier that had you de-lever and change your asset holdings, so maybe you can just focus on capital. So I think there's two reasons why we probably can't do that in the way it's written. It maybe it was written differently, we could, than Dodd-Frank, and that's because Dodd-Frank, as Basil also, um, they write very linear capital rules. So we know there's a large amount of trades that have small gains with a very high probability, and large losses with a low probability. These are carry trades, regulatory capital, arbitrage trades, financial guarantee insurance are just some examples of those. Well, they're pretty inefficient from a capital regulatory point of view because what you really care about is those low probability states because those tend to be the systemic states. So you really need to hold a lot of capital in those states. So if you require these firms to hold lots of capital, that would be one way to go up to change the regulatory system. It's not been done yet. Uh, unfortunately, you're, you're having them hold lots of capital in 95% of the other states where you don't need much capital. So you really need to start a state contingent capital uh, that, that hasn't been implemented. So um, capital regulation is going to be too little or too much. Too little, it doesn't cover the losses in the, in the bad states. Too much because it, it is too much in, in those other, in the, in the uh, good states. So. Um, that's one reason why you might not want to just focus on capital regulation. The second uh, reason, and this came up yesterday a little bit in, in discussions, is that it's very difficult for, to kind of measure leverage at the institutional uh, level um, because kind of Wall Street's always ahead of you. There was the repo 105 of Lehman. There was the off-balance sheet financing the, in the asset-backed um, commercial paper market. Um, there was, I think there was a study by the Fed, New York Fed, that showed a lot of gaming around quarterly, uh, quarterly reports. So it's very difficult to kind of exactly pinpoint um, leverage at an institutional level. So even if you define capital requirements, you know, you're going to get around them. And in fact, if you looked at the firms that really effectively failed during our financial crisis, you know, they were well capitalized on a, on a regulatory level, and they actually, if you use the current rules, they still would be well capitalized. So it's not clear that capital is enough. It, it might be um, important, but it may not be enough. It's also a question, really, we don't have a good, this goes back to the research idea, and it's the big, there's a big debate in it right now in, in finance about what's the right level of capital? What's the cost of capital? Is it just taking advantage of the the uh, safety net and the tax advantage of debt, or the real cost of holding lots of capital on your uh, books. So we need to get a hold of that, really, before we start uh, moving capital around quite a bit. Uh, so Volcker, so two criticisms. Uh, the first is that uh, it hurts diversification. So the argument is that the Volcker rule is going to increase risk because it's going to decrease diversification. You know, you're no longer allowing banks to invest in certain securities, um, that's going to decrease the, increase the volatility of their portfolio. Um, so I think that's a bad argument. It's not a bad argument because the volatility portfolio will probably uh, uh, increase when you, you take um, <coughs> uh, Volcker out potentially, if, if the leverage stays the same. Um, but it really confuses idiosyncratic versus systematic risk. What we care about is systematic risk. That's what we care about in a crisis. That's when it emerges. So uh, taking out, um, you know, when, when you have, you reduce, we take out, you add proprietary trading to the, the, you add 
principal trading to your portfolio, you're just increasing the amount of systematic risk. You're not diversifying uh, systematic risk. You, that's by definition, that's not what you can't do. And there's a big literature on this, pre-crisis, post-crisis. Uh, there are a lot of papers that try and look at the, um, the risk, uh, the in individual and uh, um, aggregate risk of uh, financial institutions um, with or without uh, proprietary type trading. And the evidence is pretty strong that um, it does not reduce primary, um, does not reduce uh, systematic risk. On synergies, uh, there's a much, I think they have a much stronger argument. Um, I think it is the case, if you're active in primary markets, if you underwrite, um, it's easy to be active in secondary markets, right? If I, if I underwrite, uh, I know a lot more about the corporate bond market than some other markets, but if I underwrite corporate bonds, I know who the investors were who purchased them. I know which investors may have wanted them. Um, I have a big database of investors. So when I'm in <coughs> secondary markets trying to make markets, it's easy for me to, um, to sort of to try and it's the search cost is much lower because I can search for, I know Fidelity owes a bunch, owns a bunch of this stuff and likes the stuff. I can try and sell it to Fidelity when someone uh, wants to sell their bonds to me. So I think that there is synergies between primary and secondary uh, markets that, you know, is a reason why I think the Volcker rule had this uh, concern about market making, which is kind of well-founded. So to get to that argument, uh, I don't think anyone would disagree here that market making and hedging are key financial activities. Uh, they're, they're important. And I think it's definitely a possibility, depending on how the rule's written, that if you restrict these activities through the Volcker rule, you may impede these activities, and that could impact liquidity and the pricing in the market. And that may not be sufficiently, that may be more costly than the benefits of Volcker. So that's a trade-off that you'd have to um, be worried about. But let me just make three points about liquidity, which I think um, you know, go a little bit in maybe a different uh, direction. And the first that Jennifer already re referred to, there was a study done um, by Oliver Wyman, which may be the study that you're referring to, a big study, very, got a lot of notoriety about how this is going to you know, end the corporate bond market as we know it, uh, the Volcker rule is. And they relied a lot on a study by Lando and some guys, um, David Lando and his co-authors. And that study, what, they sh what Lando showed was that in the financial crisis, the dealer firms, so if you were a dealer, if you were the underwriter of a particular bond, that bond did poorly if you ran into trouble. And that's very consistent with what we think in finance. When you run into trouble, you begin to disintermediate. And so those bonds became kind of less liquid. And there's, it, although it's about a lot of firms, it focuses a lot, quite a lot on, on Lehman. And that's like, look what happens when you pull, take out market making, or restrict market making, you get a, a big liquidity uh, shock. Mm -hmm. I think that, though, is a little bit actually supports the Volcker rule, doesn't hurt it. And it's because they're focusing on a time in crisis. Right? Liquidity is most important during a crisis. What this tells me is do we really want to concentrate all the market making activities at systemically risky uh, financial firms? Those aren't the ones that are going to step in front of the uh, train. They can't during a crisis period. So it's not clear to me. I think um, it was mentioned uh, at the beginning that the Volcker rule is already taken into account and that you know, there's been a big, a uh, lot of volatility in the bond market over the last month or so as, as interest rates have uh, pushed, pushed up and dealers haven't been stepping in front and so it's hurt liquidity. I don't know of any dealer, if everyone's on one side trying to sell, who stands in front and buys. So uh, dealers really, they'll, they, will, they may try and facilitate between buyers and sellers, but they've never been willing to take that, um, to take that risk um, head, head on. It's only indicative in the OTC, in the corporate bond market, which I know well, that's uh, certainly not the way they, they uh, operate. I think there's a second point here, along, upset for the point about uh, liquidity in times of crisis, is really, you know, we focus a lot on the, uh, writing a rule that measures trading intent versus trading intent, right? I think we would all agree there is trading intent when firms uh, make decisions here or there, but the, the, whether you can measure it or write a rule to measure it uh, 
is a problem. So I think that tells you a little bit about maybe how the rule should be written. It shouldn't be written as a rule trying to measure trading intent. It should be really written to try and get at the bottom of, um, of this issue. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then the third thing is, you know, it's very easy. There's no doubt as you, uh, if you change, um, make it a little more difficult to uh, um, uh, make markets, there's going to be a short run impact on liquidity. Um, and, but in the long run, it's not clear what's going to happen, right? Uh, financial markets adjust and they move. It may be the current system is just a bad system. So we, we need to have a different system. If you have large, complex firms, if they're dominating the market making area, are they dominating because they're, they're more efficient or are they dominating it because they have access to the safety net? If it's the latter, I don't like it. If it's a former, then I think that's, uh, that is um, uh, an issue. Uh, implementing Volcker. So I'm, you know, I was also a little perturbed uh, about how complex the rule had gotten when, you know, when they came out with the, um, the suggestions um, earlier. I think we shouldn't give up so much e so easily on a simpler version of the rule. Complex rules are very easy to game. They're also regulators you know, cross the I's, sorry, dot, dot the I's, cross the T's, and, you know, they're in compliance, I'm good to go. I think it, you really need kind of enhanced regulatory supervision with a simple type rule, so I'll talk about that in a second. I also think it's not that rocket science. You can look at how AIG wrote 530 billion of CDS, okay? They didn't, it was gross exposure. Goldman Sachs uh, took out the insurance and then passed it on Elsewhere in the financial system, they had very little uh, net um, inventory, although they were big players in that market. Merrill Lynch were a big buyer of insurance from Goldman. Then when they figured out that they could just go directly to AIG and not go and bypass Goldman, they did. And when AIG got away from the market, Mer uh, Merrill Lynch decided to hold on to that risk. So you can look at sort of inventory type positions through, and this is a big part of uh, the, the problem that arose, you can look at those positions and get a pretty good idea of who's, uh, who's taking risk and who's not taking risk. So in terms of implementing, the first point to make is, you know, there's, so there are two things we care about, systemic risk and market liquidity. So the first thing about risk is, risk is risk, whether it's market making, principal trading, or I don't have a clue what it, of, of whether I'm market making or trading. That doesn't change. If you're holding $100 billion of AAA non-prime mortgage-backed securities on your books, that risk is the same no matter what you call it. So there's an issue about how to manage that, that risk. Now, it is true that from a societal point of view, if you are holding that to provide liquidity to the marketplace to uh, increase, improve better pricing and better information flow, then that, those benefits may outweigh the costs of holding that, that risk. So, uh, so what do you do? So I really think that the way to go about is a very simple rule that really creates safe harbors. So if you, and I, you know, you have to figure out what this amount is, but if you have limits on gross inventory, limits on, uh, some limits on net inventory, um, on your books, your balance sheet, relative to your assets uh, that you, you have, uh, uh, holding some restrictions there. If you're below this, if you're below those ranges, you can do whatever you want. You can market make, principal trade, whatever. Who cares? If you go over those limits, you can't do it. Then you have to convince a regulator that you're actually making markets. So an example would be: suppose you went out and you did a, you underwrote a billion dollars of Exxon corporate bonds, and something happened that day, and you couldn't. You know, you couldn't sell it, so you're holding a hundred. You know, you're holding a uh, hundred million on your books. Um, maybe, and you're over the the inventory limit. You might have to convince a regulator. Look, this is what happened. I issued a billion dollars of thing. I couldn't sell it. It's going to take me a while to unload it. That's that's fine. But if you're holding, uh, you know, forty billion dollars of Portuguese <coughs> government debt sovereign debt on your books with no capital, you're going to have to justify why you're, why you're doing that. So I think a, a safe harbor with supervisory permission outside that safe harbor would be kind of consistent with the spirit of the Volcker rule, but might get around some of these kind of complex uh, 
um, issues. Anyway, uh, thank you. Thanks, Matt and Charles. Thanks for that one clap. <laughs> <laughs> Two claps. <laughs> Let's see if I can figure this machine out. Am I on the machine? Anybody know yeah. whether my presentation's on? Yeah. This? Which one would it be? Maybe. It uh, I brought a backup in case it's not on here. I didn't load it. Did somebody else? Did I you did load it? Um, you want to take a look? You can put my one up again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't think that's it. But is there a technical person? Or do you want to do it, Paul? I don't know where it is. It's oh, I have a stick. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just do that. Thing. Great, thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think this is a great conversation. Uh, the first two presentations I thought were extremely sensible and uh, based on good thinking. And I'm going to try to follow their example, although I'm going to end up in a pretty different place. So I'm going to start by being a little more provocative. I think that the, there's a deeper question which the Volcker and I'll talk about the Honig rule, because Honig's an extension of Volcker, and you heard a lot of his propaganda yesterday. So the, the question uh, is, do we want to destroy US global universal banking? Uh, by the way, how many people here really think they understand US global universal banking as a business, as a line of businesses, as a strategy, as something that's actually, can you really even describe where the monies are coming from? how the relationships are structured, where the, how the value is created. And my point is, when we look at the Volcker and the Honig proposals, that they are fundamentally, certainly possibly, going to destroy, Volcker possibly by itself, but certainly with the Honig extensions of it, they, they could destroy the current uh, business strategy, depending, of course, on what your understanding of that business strategy is. So in the previous two presentations, there were a couple of things said. One was, by both speakers, proprietary trading is not a core activity of banks. How do they know that? Uh, I certainly don't think they do, because uh, I don't think it's true. I think it is a, potentially a core activity. But we have to understand what that means. What is a core activity? You know, if we had been looking at national banks in 1912, Real estate lending was prohibited by all national banks, not just in small amount, completely prohibited, because it was taken as a presumption that real estate lending is not a core activity properly defined of banking, and that it was viewed as excessively risky. By the way, maybe they were onto something. <laughs> and that how did national banks ever get involved in real estate lending? I'll tell you the answer. In the 1913 Federal Reserve Act, as a way to bring agricultural interests on board with the idea of creating a central bank, real estate lending prohibitions were relaxed so that you could make loans on agriculture. In other words, politics defines what's core, and uh, often in a, irrespective of, of ideology. But another thing is what's core is a moving target. Matt said underwriting's core. He's right. It's core because if you understand the relationship 
between banks, global universal banks, and their clients, they have to do not just lending and deposit taking, but it makes sense that they combine that with underwriting. But that wasn't the view until the 1980s in the US. And so are we so sure that we know what core is and what core isn't? I'm going to take you through some arguments about why proprietary trading maybe is core. Um, and I, before I do that, though, I want to point out, I'm not so sure that I'm right. I've been trying very hard to figure this out. And I, if I don't know whether I'm right, I also very much doubt whether any of you knows whether it is a core activity. I'll go through some of that. Second question. Isn't an activity that, in some unusual sense, contributes to systemic risk, as Matt claimed? Well, I think pretty clearly the answer to that is no. Now, he slipped in, of course, that his view was, well, look at securitization of mortgages. But securitization has not been prohibited under the Volcker rule, as far as I can tell. And that the holding of all of these, especially real estate-backed loans and securities, is still something that these banks can do. They can hold bonds, too. So I don't, I don't understand the concept of interpreting proprietary trading as excluding banks from securitizing or from holding positions in securitized assets. I think that they can do that, um, especially things that are mortgage related. So if, if that got slipped into the Volcker rule, I missed it. So saying that, yeah, all of these exposures to securitized uh, instruments were a problem is not the same as saying proprietary trading is a problem. By the way, mortgage-backed securities were not very widely traded prior, prior, prior to the crisis. They were typically sold and held. So making that connection, I think, is actually very deceptive. They were not, that's not what we're talking about. This was a crisis that was largely driven by risky mortgage lending. That has nothing to do, I think, with the question of proprietary trading. Now, furthermore, if you believe that systemic risk is about banks purposely taking too much loading on a particular risk and that they want to do it intentionally to maximize their safety net subsidy, then obviously there are arbitrarily large numbers of ways under current regulations, even if we prohibited proprietary trading, for banks to do that. Uh, that is with loans. So let me start us off by pointing out what this thing can't accomplish. Well, obviously, it won't fix the too-big-to-fail problem. By the way, remember, too-big-to-fail originated through an energy lender in the 1970s and 1980s that went bust in 1983-84, named Continental Illinois. It had six branches in Chicago. By current standards, it would be considered a very small bank. It wasn't involved in anything that we would recognize, I think, as being affecting part of this conversation. And so if we can't muster the courage in our regulatory community, by the way, Paul Volcker, ironically, of course, was the person who made push to bail out Continental Illinois. If a small lender located a narrowly defined bank doing small lending that happened to be very undiversified goes bust and we bail that out, um, well, it sounds like we're going to bail out just about everything. So if Obviously, we're not going to solve the risk-taking incentive problems of banks, nor the uh, decisions of bureaucrats to bail out things they shouldn't. We're not going to solve that with this proprietary trading ban. But we may be creating a lot of big social costs. Now, one of the big social costs I'll talk about has to do with market making and that chilling effect that Jennifer talked about and also that Matt talked about. But there's another social cost, which is, what if they are wrong? And I don't want to put too much emphasis, because Jennifer didn't really have an op say, state an opinion, but Matt did. What if all those opinions we're getting about this not being part of the core activity of banks is wrong? And are there reasons to think that it should be? So first of all, we have a social cost relating to chilling effects on markets if there aren't good uh, short or long-term substitutes for banks' involvement. But there may actually be other social costs. And my final point is, if really what we're interested in solving is excessive systemic risk problems relating to bad incentives of too big to fail banks, we should take that on. And here I agree very much with Matt that the Basel system is uh, not doing that, that a simple sort of capital regulation by itself isn't going to do it. And I'm not going to take you through my list, although it, it is in the handout that I distributed. 
of all the things that we could do and should do along a different approach based on incentives and more of a kind of dynamic thinking about making an environment where banks are uncomfortable generating large losses, thinking of it that way from the standpoint of their own incentives. So now let's focus in on what's so wrong about these rules. Okay, so um, the first thing I do, I do want to point out is Paul Volcker has always been advocating things. It's just, just like Carter Glass in 1933 who finally got to prohibit investment banking. Well, he wanted to for uh, more than two decades. Uh, he got his opportunity not because there was any connection between investment banking and the Great Depression. In fact, all the literature shows that it was the opposite. The investment banking activities by banks in the 20s had actually l reduced their risk and were uh, a good thing. And nonetheless, the PCORA hearings found, in quotation marks, found that it was a bad thing and it was prohibited. And uh, Paul Volcker, if it had been up to him, it never would have been relaxed. So we wouldn't be talking even about underwriting. Uh, Paul has never been supportive of relaxing anything. He thinks banks should be deposit taking and lending institutions, as far as I can tell. Um, is this going to be distinguishable as an activity? Here I very much agree with Matt, too. Of course it's not going to be distinguishable as an activity. It's a losing proposition. And if we're going to do this, I also agree with him that the best way to do this is to create some safe harbors based on some simple rules about inventories. Or maybe you could talk about rules that would say if banks generate large losses, so you might limit the amount they could both profit or lose on this portfolio, and then if they exceed showing that they have a great, too great a variance, you might punish them in some way. So I, I like his idea, if I understand it, that we should measure what we can measure and not go for the impossible uh, measurement of something we're not going to be able to do. Now, of course, as I understand Honig, he wants to go farther. He wants to basically get rid of all securities involvement, meaning uh, banks shouldn't be involved in setting up hedges for their clients, and they shouldn't be involved in market making. And that's, of course, in a sense, a solution to the Volcker rule problem. You just get rid of all activity by uh, American banks uh, in, these act in these markets, and then you don't have to make distinctions. Uh, OK, so now let's get to the heart of the matter. So what are the costs of doing these things? Um, why should we want our universal banks? Because obviously, mom and pop banks aren't going to be involved in this. They shouldn't be. It's, not, it's clearly not who their customers are. But what about, the, uh, what about the, the global universal banks? OK, first of all, there's a client synergy that you have to be thinking about. Global universal banks should do what global non-financial corporations, for whom they provide unique client relationships, want them to do. So Matt said, and I agree with him, Obviously, they're going to be helpful in setting up hedges for people. Um, that's part of your relationship. If you are managing someone's underwriting and lending and cash flow disbursements globally, you're also helping them measure what their risks are and lay off risks that they don't like. And you're thinking you're really part of a sort of strategic outsourcing of the company. And so obviously, you're going to be involved in what are often called deal teams to execute a particular hedge as part of a client relationship. Now, who is going to be sitting on that team? The people sitting on that team will often be proprietary traders who design the instruments that are being used for hedging. So that's why I sometimes call this the Volcker lobotomy, because what it does is it removes from the banking organization the human capital of the people who really understand these instruments the best. And so now you have to ask those Hewlett Packard or whoever, Shell Oil or whoever, is, is sitting down to figure out how to do a potentially a very complicated global hedge. Do they want the advice on how to do that coming from somebody who doesn't invent these instruments and doesn't trade in them for profit? I'm not so sure they do. Well, then it starts looking like proprietary trading is part of the core activities of the bank because its existence within the bank means that they have the human capital to provide fairly complicated, knowledgeable information to clients at crucial points where the client needs it. Well, why can't outsiders do that? Because the client needs a holistic strategy for its corporate capital structure, its hedging strategy, and lots of other things, which the bank, as part of its relationship, hopes to deliver. 
Now, you could look at that and say, that's far-fetched, that argument that professor just made. Maybe you're right. I, would, I can tell you that you can't tell me it's wrong, because no one to date, to my knowledge, has looked at the data or tried to do studies of banks inside their, their organizations to figure out whether that story is right or wrong and how big that cost might be. Um, what about, uh, here's another story. So there's a paper by Arnold Boot and Lev Retnovsky, which says, you know, making markets uh, is a huge uh, economies of scale driven activity. That is, you really need to be an extremely large financial institution to be able to make markets properly. And so the reason why banks are doing this is not because there is a, a relationship synergy per se or a human capital synergy, but rather because you want to locate market making in very, very large organizations, and those just happen to be global universal banks. So are there other substitutes for them out there that are similarly large? Maybe. I, I can't think of any. So how do we know that hedge funds that are much smaller, like I think JP Morgan right now might be something like $4 trillion in total assets. It's a pretty big financial institution. So is it really necessary that you be $4 trillion, or would be $1 trillion be enough, or would $500 billion be enough? Does anybody think he or she has the answer to that question? Now, I remember uh, back in 1979, because I'm that old, studying with Ron McKinnon at Stanford. Ron wrote a book in 1979 called Money and International Exchange. And what was the point of that book? The point of that book was bemoaning the complete lack of liquidity in foreign exchange markets globally. It happened to be prior to the invention of global universal banking in London in 1986 and in the United States pretty much around the same time. It isn't so easy just based on finance professor thinking, and I'm not to point to Matt, but generally, to just think, well, markets exist. Well, markets don't, haven't always existed quite to the same extent that they do now. And we're taking something for granted that we don't know is true, that in the absence of allowing global universal banks to do market making, that market making would be just as good. And now, guess what? Some of the people who have a stake in this, and I'm not talking about global universal banks, I'm talking about the Bank of Mexico. Matt was pointing out that I think the Bank of Japan, but I don't know, uh, are extremely worried about this because they like having global liquid markets for Mexican sovereign debt and the peso relative to the dollar. And so what they're really doing, they're weighing in in their comments to Jennifer and others, they're saying, we think that uh, this is going to be a big problem for our banks to make a local market because of the, remember, the Volcker rule doesn't just reach to cover US headquartered banks or not even just operations within the United States, but it reaches to all banks that have any operations in the US. That's everybody. And so let's read what the, so what the Mexicans are telling us, and I'll show you some slides in a minute is, they're really worried about what the effect of this is going to have on the markets for liquidity, the markets and liquidity for sovereign debt in Mexico and for foreign exchange in Mexico because of the very, very wide reach of this. And I think you can extrapolate beyond that to say that if the Volcker rule doesn't worry about this problem and if there is a legitimate concern, as I think there is, and as these people also think there is, that might mean that the ultimate adjustment in the market is to move away from New York as a financial center, to move away from the dollar as a reserve currency. Now, again, you might say, how far-fetched this professor, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, maybe I don't, but I certainly doubt that you know that I'm wrong. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about financial history, and what I've learned from that is that finance professors and lawyers tend to take things for granted about the world they happen to be living in. This world is different from the one that existed 30 years ago in very important ways. And now we're just talking about, based on no information and no evidence, fundamentally changing the world and assuming that everything will be OK. It's like Alice in Wonderland to me. Here are just some of the quotes that I wanted you to see. Um, the Volcker rule would apply to the Mexican banking system almost to the same extent as in the United States. And then the point is not because the Mexican banking system is all owned by US headquartered banks. No, it's only one. 
But the problem is that the reach of the Volcker rule will encompass all banks in their operations in Mexico just by virtue of the fact that they also have operations in the US. In other words, the only way a global universal bank, if it's going to exist, and operate in Mexico as it wants to, maybe the only way it can do that is to stop operating in the US. Now, that should worry us a little bit. I just thought I'd highlight some of these things. I don't want to go too crazy. You can read these for yourself. So my point so far is, is it doesn't solve the too-big-to-fail problem. Proprietary trading was not about this crisis that we just went through. And it carries with it a lot of big risks, even if we can get rid of uh, uh, proprietary trading. I'm not sure that we want to for the sake of global markets or for the sake of U.S. universal banks. And we might end up with a world in which universal banking is done outside the United States and securities markets transactions are also done outside the United States, much more than they are now. And so I just leave you, I won't go through my many slides about what's my approach. So my approach is to do what, fix the real problem instead, that is to think hard about how to solve too big to fail, to think hard about how to solve um, incentive problems in the banking system and the regulatory system, and move as quickly and as far away from uh, this iceberg as we possibly can. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. So there's a number of very interesting points that have been raised here by all three panelists. And I thought I'd just ask a couple of quick questions and then open it up to the audience. I'm sure the people here who also have some questions they'd like to ask. Um, what I struck by in particular was the idea of a safe harbor um, having simple rules. Um, last month in New York, uh, Paul Volcker gave a speech at the New York Economic Club. And he highlighted a couple of points, mainly that he thought the Volcker rule could basically be written in four pages. And he also launched a shot across the bow against the, the fact that we've got at least six financial regulatory agencies in this country. And he thinks you only really need two at most. Um, so if the solution perhaps is the safe harbor idea with the simple rules, but then the key question that strikes me is who's going to regulate this? And who's going to have the power to step in and tell banks? And also, in the example you gave, Matt, about someone some, perhaps buying a lot of bonds and being stuck with them in Exxon, who would they have to go to? Who would they have to sort of, it strikes me you have a very you know, wide-ranging regulatory framework here. And I'm also asking this question, too, because during the London Well Trade episode, we did have federal supervisors in that bank, and they completely missed it. So, uh, obviously, Matt and... Yeah, I mean, clearly it would be the, the, the institutions that supervise banks, like the Fed or um, the FDIC, if they take... It wouldn't be the SEC or the, or the CFTC. There's no doubt that it, it relies on a better regulators. Right, so um, if you don't think regulators have the ability to regulate, then that says something really about our regulatory uh, system. But I mean, I think the idea of the safe harbor is you don't worry until you hit certain inventory limits, and then you go in and you find out, you know, what's going on. And you know, the um, and I think in theory, the ex the example you give of the of the the world that would probably b be caught in this system because they, you know, they had a pos position, they put on a hedge, they took off the hedge and they kind of doubled down in the market. So that would show up as a big position and the regulator would go on and say, what are you doing? And so if it was a good regulator, I think you actually would have caught that if you had the Volcker rule with some uh, safe harbor. Would you catch everything? Probably not because they figure out ways to, to get around it, but you, you know, you do the best that you can. Just if I could just make one comment. I believe the um, exempt from the Volcker rule are agency secu agency backed securities and treasuries, not asset backed securities. So uh, you know they will be subject to the Volcker rule. It, of course, you you know the rule has this uh, short term versus short term versus long term. So it's unclear how they're going to write the rule, but it's not. Uh, it is part of the rule. And whether the rule at the end, you know, uh, exempts it because of the, some 
definition, that would not be the definition I, I, I would have. No, I was just going to say, of course, you know, the banks are uh, certainly involved both in credit cards and mortgages and other things in securitizing and retaining junior positions as part of the origination process in their securitization conduits. So I think that we have to just, you know, it, this was not a, a trading issue. Those things were not short-term traded instruments very much. They were actually quite illiquid markets for the most part. So I, I think that there's, in my view, there was never an intention to stop banks from securitizing in the mortgage market in the, in the Volcker rule. Now, if that's, if no, that's, the, the, what, if that's what we're going to talk about, no, should banks secure, be prevented from Charlie, securitizing? they can securitize. The question is whether they can hold the, you know, securitize, sell them up and bring them back on their balance sheet like they, like they did. Well, right. do we feel better if they only hold the junior instruments? I'm not so sure. I don't, you know, I'm not sure that that's... Uh, I mean, I'm just saying, I think it's this a, is a you red know, It's a question herring. of how much capital is underneath right. it, right? I mean, it, it's a red herring. I mean, to say that it was, that, that it was trading, proprietary trading, because they were holding uh, positions in originated subprime and derivative securities is really, it wasn't about trading. It was about the long-term investments. That's where the losses were. But it wasn't, it, it, the, uh, the, it's, it's trading on their own accounts, whether they're holding it for, you know, the prices are changing, you know, daily. So it's, it's not like they can sell at any time. It's not like they're, they're forced to hold them for a year or two years or five years. No, but in practice, those were long-term investments. Well, financed, you know, overnight repo. Yeah. I, I'm just saying, if we want to have a conversation about whether banks should be involved in securitizing mortgages, let's have that conversation. And we could also be asking whether they should be involved in real estate finance generally. Of course, banks are heavily involved in it because of the regulatory pushes that have pushed them into it going back to 1913. And we could go through that regulatory history. And it isn't going away, by the way, because Congress made it and made it for a reason. But that's, that's a different issue, right? And, re and real estate, of course, is where systemic risk comes from, pretty much. I want to make yeah. a couple of comments, one related to uh, Volcker saying that the rule could be written in four pages. Yes. And uh, first, I do want to agree with uh, one of the points that you made, Charlie, in your talk about the need to understand how, and I think I highlighted this in my talk, how proprietary trading is interwoven in the bank, how it adds value to these large um, universal banks. I think that's a very important question. In the proposing release, the agencies were heavily criticized for the number of questions that we put into the release. And I find this actually a bit perverse, because if this, we were criticized for, assumed we would not know much about how to implement this particular rule. So when we go to the proposal and we actually put in a lot of questions and try and learn, um, then there's lots of negative commentary about that. So I, I just find that a little bit strange. And in regards to writing the rule in four pages, it depends on whether you want to see uh, an economic justification for the rule, um, a motivation for what the regulator's thinking was, information on the baseline and how we would like to measure the costs and benefits. Uh, so I think, you know, four pages possible if you're just looking at statutory text, but if you actually want to understand the underpinnings of the legal and economic motivations, you would like to see something much larger. Right. Okay, so this is a rule that's yet to be formally set out, yet alone, let alone implemented. And yet we've seen banks basically say, it's coming, I have to take action. And what strikes me as being most interesting here is that unlike other aspects of Dodd-Frank, particularly swap trading, we haven't seen banks suddenly give up that franchise because it's so profitable for them. Um, they're staying in there and continuing to lobby. And in fact, this week we've seen, another, seen the House approve another way to try and perhaps dilute the power of, of swap execution facility trading rules, et cetera. But when it comes to the Volcker rule, we've seen a dramatic drop in level three assets held by banks. We've seen banks really step back. And so the question I've got here is, is this an admission by the banking industry itself that you do need something like Volcker, that they were taking too much risk pre-2007, that they were in fact prop trading, which is why so many people have left the banking industry and gone into hedge funds and institutional investment firms in the last couple of years. So I'd just like to throw that out to all of you and see what you think. No, it's, um, I think that it's pretty clear that when you, uh, 
say that something, when a regulator says they don't like something, mm -hmm. that you decide that you want to get rid of it. And that's not an admission of anything other than that the regulator has told you that you, you better. Um, so I, I would also point out that I don't think banks have gotten rid of their market making function. Now, uh, for example, uh, I was meeting with some people at Goldman Sachs and I asked them, explain to me how profitable market making is and risky it is. And they said, well, just they went through down a list of different business lines and they all had sharp ratios of expected profit relative to standard deviation returns of about uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, something like that, very low. And uh, sharp rate, uh, the sharp ratio for market making was 12. In other words, Goldman Sachs believes that not only is, is market making a great social function, but that it is the most favorable by an order of magnitude, maybe a couple order of magnitudes relative to other business lines from a sharp ratio standpoint. Now, sharp ratios are a flaw flawed measure of risk. Uh, they, there are peso risk issues, blah, 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 with market making. But I, I like, basically, I like Matt's approach, focus on a, a diversified and small enough inventory uh, so that you don't kill market making. I don't think the banks have stepped uh, away from market making yet because it's very profitable and they know it. Um, but there is another thing which uh, a study by uh, Daron Nissim and I recently we found, which is the banks are not getting much respect from the market for their uh, fee income generally or for non-interest income. To give you an idea of that, after you isolate this effect controlling for everything else. Prior to the crisis, an extra dollar of recurring fee income would be rewarded by the market with a $5 increase in your market value. Today, it's a $1 for $1 increase. What does the market respect? Dividend announcements. By the way, three times the effect as what it used to be. Why? Well, dividend announcements are the regulators green flag telling you that you can do something, right? So the general problem is we are now in a world where the market's reactions to what banks do is all driven by regulators. It's driv driven by the regulators' stress tests and dividend permission decisions, by what the regulators' activities think are right. And so we can't, if you look at the market value, yes, banks are doing things right now that are responding to what markets are telling them. But why are the markets punishing them for these things? Not necessarily because of fundamental risks. As I said, the sharp ratio, unless they were lying to me at Goldman Sachs, they know that this is really profitable. But you know, there's a question of whether you want to uh, try to demonstrate success to the market if all the market cares about is what your regulator thinks. If I can just say a couple of things. First of all, I don't want to sound like a rabid uh, supporter of Volcker because that makes me sound like a big supporter of Dot Frank. So, um, but again, the context of Dot Frank, I mean, I'm agreeing with Charlie on the uh, market making. It is, you know, studies that have been done show it's very high sharp ratio. You can't get that sharp ratio holding a big inventory. It's not possible. It's, um, so uh, the only question really is whether uh, removing, you know, putting restrictions on trading hurts your ability to, to sort of understand markets and make markets, which is what Charlie uh, talked about. With one and three, I don't know if they've reduced it because of Volcker, but, you know, there is an argument that um, Goldman Sachs doesn't, you know, maybe isn't the right institution to be owning a golf course in Japan, or Lehman Brothers, a big property development down in California, because, you know, other folks can own those things, and these firms are systemically risky. So I think that the, whether Volcker addresses um, those activities or, or uh, asset-backed securities that are held um, longer term is, you know, depends on how the rule is written, but I don't think it's a bad thing that level three assets have de decreased at these systemically important institutions. And, and by the way, I don't think so either. Yeah. Right. I guess your question, part of your question was about why we might see a difference in industry reaction to the Volcker rule mm -hmm. versus the swaps rules. Yeah. And I can't speak to their motivation. Right. Uh, but I would guess it may have something to do with looking at the explicitness of the statute. So if, you know, on the Volcker rule, it does say there's a prohibition on proprietary trading. And many of the uh, swap rules um, were still developing and writing those. And so um, people may be looking at the probabilities of where things will end up. And I would guess that may be part of what's driving differences. Uh, 
I'd like to open it up to audience questions. So if anyone has a question they'd like to ask, please, uh, gentlemen up here. trading oriented and, and uh, kind of market making oriented uh, with banks. And it happened because the commodity bubble in the 1970s kind of blew up in an ugly way in, in 1980. It did create risks for the banking system. You know, Volcker himself was there uh, supervising that. You had the Hunt Silver crisis as, as one e example. Um, so does this mean that we're going to go back to an era where it's the commodity trading houses uh, that uh, are going to be sources of potential systemic risk? That's a good you didn't question. mention commodity trading as one of yeah. your core functions. Of banks, no, I, but I, I agree with you that that's. I, I mean, I look at hedging, of course, as corporate strategies for capital have to do with commodity trading too. And what's a commodity, by the way? Oil. Yeah. yeah well, not just oil, but euro dollars are <laughs> commodity too. Um, by the way, when I was referring to 1986, Pete, you're very American centric. I wasn't talking about the United States. I was talking about the UK because that was the date of the Big Bang. And it was a securities market reg deregulation of the London Stock Exchange. But here's something that I'll bet none of you is aware of. Within five years of Margaret Thatcher's Big Bang, the ratio of private bank credit to GDP tripled in the UK. It's one of the most amazing changes in bank credit that we've ever seen. Why? Because uh, there really was such a thing as global universal banking. In other words, deregulation of the securities markets, in that case the London Stock Exchange, and the banking system had some interesting synergies that, by the way, to my knowledge, no one has ever really convincingly explained. But I would point you in the direction of that ignorance to point out that we don't really fully understand yet 25, 27 years after this phenomenon has started. And similar things happened in the U.S. in 1987 with the Supreme Court, or some court's decision, allowing the Federal Reserve uh, to proceed with uh, the relaxation of Glass-Steagall. So it, it's a really, uh, um, I think as a historian, what's striking to me is we know very little about this banking model. And so knowing, and what we, we do know is when we go back to the 1980s in the U.S. and the U.K., it was a very different world prior to these changes. And it's a world that I wouldn't want to revisit. So the, there hasn't been much discussion about the metrics that uh, Volcker uses or would use to judge whether something is prop trading or it's market making. And the point has been made that, in fact, these metrics will induce perverse behavior in that banks will exit the very trades where market making is the most important. So any comments on that? Well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm somewhat against these metrics. I, I mean, I am in agreement that if, if we can't define it, it's going to be difficult to write a rule based on that. That's why I prefer a very simple safe harbor thing where you just look at the balance sheet and see um, the holdings. That's not perfect. But it's going to be tougher to game because it's uh, simply the same way. But you know, leverage ratios. Uh, you know, if you have risk-weighted assets, and now Basel has put in the leverage ratio, and it's in some countries have like Canada. You know, it's a sensible thing to do because it it's not perfect, but it it prevents a little bit of the of the gaming. So um, on the precise metrics, I think I think you're right. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question, uh, something that Jennifer said, because I'm, as you know, I'm supportive of Matt's idea that something simple that's kind of an inventory limit might be a, a good way to implement this, uh, given that the law says we have to. But one of your comments, I thought you were saying, and I'm not sure I interpret it right, that maybe the regulators think that the law specifically uses the word prohibition, and so this kind of approach is dead on arrival? Is that, I'm trying to understand how, how do you, could you uh, remark on whether it would be possible to do well, something I, like I this? can't remark on that. I'm not an attorney, and so I don't want to try to interpret the securities laws. So I, just in regards to the question, 
as an individual, how might I approach what changes I'm going to make to my business? How specific is the statute about what it's implementing? And how much discretion is actually left and uncertainty to regulators to decide what the rules will actually look like? So, um, but I think in terms of the Volcker rule, there are the words prohibition on prop trading. I could be wrong on that, so we can check, but it's fairly explicit. In regards to the metrics, I will say that we've received a ton of comment on them. So, for what it's worth, there are a lot of people looking at it. Just to get around Charlie's point, I guess you could say anything in safe harbor is market making, and anything outside of safe harbor is not. It works so, for me, I guess. You know. <laughs> it works for us, but does it work for the lawyers? We've got time for one more question from the audience. So, anyone has anything? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, it turns out that, Charlie, you mentioned that uh, the Volcker rule uh, basically had nothing to do with the financial crisis or wasn't a fundamental cause of the financial crisis. Matt seemed to suggest that there's systemic risk associated with some proprietary trading. And I wonder if, Matt, if you would uh, agree or, uh, or disagree with Charlie and say that proprietary was indeed a fundamental cause of the financial crisis. And then the second related question is there's some misunderstanding perhaps between the two of you as to uh, the exempt uh, securities from proprietary trading. That's you mentioned question. agency securities and treasury securities. And I wonder if you would allow for additional exemptions uh, if you were putting together the role along the lines what uh, Charlie seemed was suggesting, such as, for example, private label mortgage-backed securities, would you go beyond the two exemptions? Yeah, no, so I think we, we are talking a little bit cross purposes. I mean, my view, I don't really care what the statute says about what proprietary trading is. I view it as trading on your own account, principal trading. I look at what the large banks and investment banks did during the crisis. They, their large losses were in asset backed securities that didn't have capital underneath them. That's why they they ran aground. I mean, there are some firms like Washington Mutual, IndyMac, which was loans, but these firms were heavy, heavy, heavy into non-prime mortgage-backed securities and some other asset-backed securities. So I would, I think that should be part of uh, Volca. I don't, you know, whether you call it prop trading, principal trading, trading on your own account, directional trading, whatever, to me it's the same thing. So I would not exempt, I wouldn't have exempted um, Agencies, I mean, because they think that's, you know, if you look um, at the whole financial system and the way it works is I write a loan, um, I, write a, I write a mortgage, I collect these mortgages, I then um, get the GSEs to, and if I hold these mortgages in my books, I have to hold, um, it used to be 8%, but now it's 4%, it was 4%. Then I hand it over to uh, the GSCs. The GSCs rubber stamp them. Now um, that's reduced to, uh, and I bring back on my books. Now I'm back, I'm down to 2.4%. And how much do the GSCs have to provide? 45 basis points. So it's a complete regulatory capital arbitrage. So I think the agency securities are a problem because someone's holding the risk. Right, the, the mortgages have the same risk no matter who holds them. The question is, where are they uh, systemic? And you know, we're concentrating them because of regula regulation that Charlie mentioned in uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and these large banks. That's the, the guys who held them. So I wouldn't even exempt those guys, but obviously in the, in the statute they are. So I certainly wouldn't add to the exemptions. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks so much. Well, I think we'll wrap it up now. I think everyone wants to go to lunch. But uh, thanks to the panelists, and thank you. Thanks. That was a great job. Yeah, thank you.